Hello and welcome to today's webinar on using and evaluating published genealogies. My name is Juneva Morse, the Director of Education and Online Programs here at American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be moderating today's event. We are a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history. And today's webinar was made possible by our annual fund, and we are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Giving today's presentation is Alicia Crane Williams. Alicia is a fellow of the American Society of Genealogists and the lead genealogist on the NEHGS study project, Early New England Families, 1641 to 1700. She is the former state historian of the Massachusetts Society of Mayflower Descendants and assistant historian general for the General Society of Mayflower Descendants. She is also the editor of the first three volumes of Mayflower Families through five generations, uh, John Alden, and is the former genealogist of the Alden Kindred of America. Most recently, she compiled the Babson genealogy, 1606 to 2017, descendants of Thomas and Isabel Babson. She earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Connecticut and a master's degree in historical agencies and administration from Northeastern University. So as we know, there are thousands and thousands of published genealogies out there, but as you've also probably found in your research, not all are created equal. Today we will give you the tools, the context, and the criteria for evaluating published genealogies and for determining if and how the information provided should be incorporated into your family history research. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question into the panel to the right of your screen. We'll address those after the presentation. There is no handout or syllabus for this presentation, but we are recording this event. And starting tomorrow, you can easily go back and review any of the content from the presentation on our website. So if you missed something on today's first listen, don't fret. You can always review the presentation later. All right, so without further ado, I will turn things over to Alicia. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our little chat today. I may be, um, well, I'm going to try to give you the tools that you can decide which genealogies are best. Uh, it's, uh, it may, you may discover that it's a little more effort than you wanted to take, but it's something that's necessary. All right, for, uh, it, for those of you who have uh, followed my posts on the Vita Brevis blog, you know that last year I did a series of uh, called the Perfect Ten because I was watching the Winter Olympics uh, of uh, trying to determine a scoring system for genealogies. Now, for this presentation, we've reduced that ten down to five points by consolidation. But if you want to go back to the original series and read that, uh, there may be more information for you. Plus, I, as always, I invite you, if you're not a follower of Vita Brevis, to, to do so. And if you follow my posts, you can uh, put a comment in any time suggesting uh, what topic you want to have discussed later. So the whole thing about genealogies, published genealogies, is a big catch-22, and it's not logical. Uh, if you walk into the library and you see these thousands of books on the shelves, you logically would assume that everything must be in those books. And the next logical assumption would be that everything in the books must be correct. Uh, that was what the teachers taught you when you were using your textbooks in school. But it's not quite that simple. The and we'll get, we're going to go through the list of why. But the next question, there's two more questions that uh, you're going to ask. That um, <clears throat> if uh, it where's the list of good books? <clears throat> Excuse me. And the answer is there isn't a list of good books or a list of bad books. Is there's no shortcut. You're going to have to do this uh, on your own. And then finally, you might say to me, well, if the books have errors in them, I'm not going to use the books at all. I'll just skip that uh, section. 
Well, <clears throat> that's throwing the baby out with the bathwater because there's no entirely good genealogy and there's no entirely bad genealogy. Each one of them has something that may be of interest to you. If, if nothing like a, the old thing about uh, broken watches right twice a day. So don't throw it all out and bear with me here as I give you a short history lesson of uh, genealogy. Now the books in the library, back up for a second would you? Uh, the books in the library are, have been accumulated over 200 years of, accumulate, uh, of publications and they've been written by people of differing experience levels uh, and using different methods and having access to different records. Genealogy is a grassroots occupation and most genealogies are published, written and published by someone in the family who may or may not have been exposed to the, the technical or standard uh, ge genealogical uh, rules and regulations, or indeed those rules and regulations may not have been in effect when they wrote the books. So in those 200 years, new sources, new interpretations, new methods come along, and the best analogy I can come up with is medical textbooks. They're still in the library, but you don't want your doctor going down and pulling out a a medical textbook that was published in 1880 and treating you with that. So the same caution is with the genealogists. And the, the underlying danger here is that acceptance of anything uh, in a genealogy or in primary records without analysis is extremely dangerous. And you don't want to become one of those people who puts something into your genealogy or puts something up on a uh, a tree on the websites that is going to lead somebody else astray. <clears throat> okay, next. So the short history of genealogy is uh, I'm going to uh, recommend to you uh, an article written by Harry Macy in the 1996 Register called Recognizing Scholarly Genealogy and Its Importance to Genealogists and Historians. Uh, many of the wise things that I will be telling you today came to me from Harry's article. Uh, it's a little outdated in technical issues, but it's spot on in the necessary, uh, the need for doing genealogy in a scholarly way. Now, in, in New England, genealogy goes back into at least the early 1800s and when it was a gentleman's pursuit, usually done by retired generals and judges, etc., who spent their days uh, compiling histories of their town or their county and in the process also of their families. And most of what they used in those genealogies was taken from their fa family, their private family records. And so that means that Older is not necessarily worse if indeed some of this information is taken from family records that we no longer have access to or have, have been lost or whatever. They also had access to the older family members who might, through memory, remember people that could uh, were born before the American Revolution, for example. Now, in 1847, the New England Historical and Genealogical Register was established, and it became the standard uh, periodical for genealogy, and it introduced different formats. It recognized good research. It provided opportunities for people to share and to criticize each other and to exchange information. But uh, the, the number of people who would have read this information is relatively small compared to the number of people who would have written their family genealogies. So again, if, in judging this, you're going to need to know experience levels. Okay, next. Uh, in the late 1800s, we had a, a phenomenon where the rich Americans went over to Europe and on, on the Grand Tour, and they, some of them married the, in, into the uh, aristocracy over there. And it became fashionable to have important answers, ancestors, and it, particularly to elevate your poor colonial American ancestors up in the uh, pecking level by discovering uh, interesting ancestors in England for them, perhaps even royalty. This led to a number of bad things where the, in, the inexperience of the home genealogist who tried to go and 
abstract records in England, but simply abstracted every record for the same surname, regardless of whether they were related to each other, led to mistakes. And then the, fear, the fact that there was money involved led to some outright fraud. 1922 marks the beginning of what we now call the, the new genealogy period, and a gentleman named Donald Lyons Cobus began another publication called The Genealogist, and Donald preached the scholarly scientific methods for genealogy, and in the, the next, what is it, 90 years here, um, that those uh, scholarly and scientific methods have been honed and improved and standardized so that today the standards have been codified and you can find them in various different um, places. Now the Board for Certification of Genealogists publishes a standards manual uh, and as you can see on the line here, if um, yeah, genealogy, published genealogy standards in 2014. That's the one you want. And it is a small uh, pamphlet, not pamphlet, it's a small booklet, but it has very important information that you need to know when you are applying these standards to the books that you're reading. All right, next. Okay, the big thing that the Board for Certification has established is the genealogical proof standard. And it states that to reach a sound conclusion, we need to meet all of the five components of the GPS below. We have to have done reasonably exhaustive research. We have to have done complete and accurate, or provided complete and accurate source citations. We have to, done a, have, to have done a thorough analysis and correlation amongst the records we've collected. We have to have resolved conflicting evidence, and then we have to write a soundly written conclusion based on the strongest evidence. Well, this, this standard is relatively new, and many of the old genealogies that you're going to be using didn't know about this kind of standard and didn't understand the necessity for um, checking their sources so that you get a game of pass it on where someone uh, writes a book, someone else copies out of that book, and then somebody else copies out of that so that you perpetuate uh, incorrect information. Another view of that is Robert Charles Anderson's Elements of Genealogical Analysis, uh, which is, I think, available on the NHS um, bookstore as an ebook as well as a regular book. And so Bob's version of the standards is he has two fundamental rules of genealogy. First fundamental rule is that all statements must be based only on accurately reported, carefully documented, and exhaustively analyzed records. And the second fundamental rule is you must have a sound, explicit reason for saying that any two individual records refer to the same person. I suggest that you put Bob's list and the Board for Certification lists on a, a note card and put it up before your computer so that you will always remember them. <laughs> Next, uh, n there's never a, go a good nor a bad genealogy uh, entirely. So we're going to talk about more experienced and less experienced authors and researchers and more helpful and less helpful genealogies. Um, okay, so now we're down to a perfect five rather than the perfect ten. And so these, this five includes uh, who's who in peer review, format, scope, completeness, and restraint, citations and sources, methodology and analysis, and access. And as we go through, we're going to have a case study that we will uh, look at each time we hit each uh, different category. And this is The Descendants of William Sherman of Marshfield, which was written by Mary Lovering Holman in 1936. All right, the first category, who's who in peer review? It's extremely important that you know who wrote the book and who researched the book. And there are several, there are layers of um, 
uh, expertise in the books that have been written. Some of them are completely family researched and written and not necessarily by anyone who has exposure to or access to whatever the standard um, uh, rules of the day were. Uh, the next kind is family written but professionally researched. In this case, a family member may have compiled the genealogy but then hired a professional to do some extra research, and this particularly will apply to the English ancestry. So this book has a little bit more reliability, at least as far as the professionally search, research section of the book, than the completely family researched book. And then there are the professionally researched books that are written for a client family. Um, these, these professionals are uh, hired by the family or a family association to uh, research and write uh, the complete book. And these books would have a higher reliability than any, either of the two earlier ones. You have to become familiar with the uh, reputations of the best people in genealogy. And one of the places to start is the National Genealogy Hall of Fame. Uh, if you go through and read the biographies that are there and learn those names and begin to become familiar with those names, you will uh, enhance the ability of your ability of judging the genealogies that you come across in the library. Um, the biggest name that you need to remember is Donald Lines Jacobus. Um, he is recognized as the founder of the modern school of genealogy in the United States. And at his death, he was described as the man who more than any other single individual elevated genealogy to the high degree of scholarship it now occupies. So when you hear the name Jacobus or you hear the name or you see that someone is using a Jacobus um, style or following Jacobus, etc. You're usually looking at the, the cream of the crop for the early to middle uh, 20th century. So for our uh, case study here, we're looking at the um, descendants of William Sherman that were made by Mary Lovering Coleman. And I'm trying to get my arrow going here. Um, she is also in the Genealogy Hall of Fame, uh, and her little biography uh, in the hall lists a number of the genealog genealogies that she did, including the William Sherman of Marshfield, and <clears throat> notes that each was a model of sound genealogical judgment and painstaking research in original records. Uh, and then notes that Mrs. Uh, Holman had a long career as a professional genealogist and the quality of her work placed her at the forefront of her peers. Okay, so much for peer review. Mary passes that test. And so we know that she has a reputation as being a good genealogist and presumably her, so her books will have reputation of being good. The next section, okay, yes, if you, obviously everybody in the uh, Hall of Fame is dead. So if you want to um, uh, access information about living genealogists, there are lists that you can access. The Fellows of American Society of Genealogists is an organization of 50 genealogists who are recognized for their uh, genealogical publication. The Board for Certification of Genealogists is a, uh, an organization that provides testing and, and requirements to join so that you can then use uh, initials of CG, Certified Gene Genealogist, after your name. There's also an Association of Professional Genealogists which requires no entrance exam but does provide you with biographies of uh, uh, the working professionals. And then the, the big thing is to just keep your eye out on who is writing articles in the current magazines, the Register, the American Genealogist, Mayflower De Descendant, etc. Uh, uh, an article in a genealogical magazine has been um, uh, reviewed by the editor of the magazine and therefore will have uh, more validity and more reliability than something that uh, is just published by uh, someone in a book with no review. All right, and 
this segues into keeping up with the current periodical um, literature. Whoops. Um, you uh, probably, when you get the issue of the register each uh, quarter, you may either write, you may just toss it in the corner, or you may look at the um, table of contents and you will see whether or not one of the articles refers to one of your family names and then you'll toss it in the corner if it doesn't. But don't do that. Um, there's a great amount of information in all of these periodical uh, magazines that will help you judge, help you learn about the wider world of genealogy. Uh, you can't do your genealogy in a vacuum without understanding the full discipline of genealogy. So among the things that will be in periodical literature are the reviews of books. Uh, there will be updates and corrections to earlier works, which might include earlier articles or might include books. Uh, there will be articles on education and methods and sources that will be useful to you. And the whole thing about what's new in the world of genealogy is something that you need to keep a finger on. The, uh, and as an example for a book review, and this was in the American Genealogist, if you read my original series of The Perfect Ten, I told you about the first book review I ever had, which was for a client's book. It was reviewed in the American Genealogist by David Green, the editor. And he gave, he said a few nice things, but then he went on to list this whole list of things that I had missed or gotten wrong or w was deficient in some way or another. And he made a point of saying that the parts that I got wrong usually were the parts that I had copied verbatim out of some old genealogy. So obviously I learned from that. So this is the second uh, book of the series. This is the Chase Wigglesworth genealogy. And David uh, did give me a better review. He said, Chase Wigglesworth is one of the most important multifamily genealogies we have reviewed. Thank you, David. Practically every genealogical fact is keyed specifically to an appropriate source. The compiler undertook research in original sources for many of these families, and her discussions are frequently the best now available. Of course, now available would be 1997. But the point being, other than I'm bragging a little bit, is that here you have an, uh, an opinion of the genealogist, and you have an opinion of the validity of the book. Now, David couldn't entirely uh, contain himself, so he went on to mention the few occasions where uh, he, he could add to, to what I had. But again, the, this additional information is valuable from this kind of review, which will send you to additional sources that you, will be useful for you in your genealogy. You can't, f yeah, that's okay, you can't find a, a review for every book, and re the detailed reviews like this are um, more modern, but if you can find one, you, it will be very valuable to you. Now we go back to our case study, and we look at uh, Mrs. Holman. Um, her book, the, the, the uh, Sherman genealogy was reviewed in the American Genealogist in 1936, and it was reviewed by none other than Donald Lines Jacobus. And Donald says, seldom does a reviewer have the opportunity to commend so fine a family history. Only an experienced genealogist at the height of her ability could produce such a book, and the volume is an important contribution to the history of Plymouth County. So here you have peer review and book review. Now, does this mean that everything that either Donald Lines Jacobus or Mary Loving Holman or any of the others did is perfect? That it's completely without error? No, because they're all human beings. But it does give you an idea that um, <clears throat> this book was produced by someone who had more experience than others. Um, then the current periodicals will publish corrections and additions to earlier uh, books or articles. And so here's an article by Myrtle Hyde on a re-examination of the Fisk families. And she starts out by saying that more, for more than 350 years, the multitude of Americans who descend from the Fisk family of Suffolk have had a wrong name on their pedig pedigree charts. Not a wrong person, just a wrong first name. Then she goes on 
in the next slide to um, give you information about uh, other Fisk genealogies that have been compiled. So if you haven't already read these in your research, this leads you to more information. It also mentions some articles that were written in the 30s about the family. And then it reminds you that the present article is only bringing you up to, to uh, speed on the new information so that you can't expect the article to give you everything. You need to go back and use the source material. Uh, next, uh, oh, there are uh, guides to publish works, and one is which is very uh, useful is Martin Hollick's New Englanders in the 1600s, and this is a guide to genealogical research published between 1980 and 2010, so it has that limitation on it. But you can see that for Joseph Parsons, he has listed articles in the register, including one on probable English origins. And so you will go to those articles in the register to um, uh, see what is new about Joseph Parsons. It also uh, lists a genealogy uh, that was published in 2002 um, by Gerald Parsons. And in order to help you uh, assess that genealogy, it tells you where it was reviewed in TAG and the GBR, et cetera, and so forth, so that you can use these reviews in your assessment of that genealogy. Uh, another lists that are very useful are lists of recent literature. Uh, in the Great Migration Newsletter, which is now uh, no longer being published, uh, but uh, Bob Anderson would put lists of recent literature that had to do with Great Migration immigrants. So these will, even if you don't uh, subscribe to the American Genealogist, this would lead you to some articles that are in that magazine or in other magazines that you may not know about. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I would, I'm going to assign you a homework uh, a problem. So, uh, go read every, all issues of the Great Migration Newsletter. It's all 25 years of it. It's, it's almost equal to a master's uh, degree education. Now, fraud is, in, in, does, is real, and there was actually a special edition of the Genealogical uh, Journal in 1991 that specialized entirely on genealogical deception. And it included an article by Bob Anderson on you know, We Was Robbed, the Modus Operandi of Gustav Anju. So it's just as you need to learn the names of the responsible genealogists, you need to learn the names of the irresponsible ones. And Mr. Anju was famous for making up uh, famous ancestors for his clients. I think at one time he was actually charging $9,000 to trace, and, and this would be in the, like the 19. 15, uh, $5,000 to trace someone's English ancestry. So for that money, he could make up some, some new ancestors for anybody. All right, the next section is format, scope, completeness, and restraint. Uh, the uh, various different uh, formats, which you, will, you are either uh, familiar with now or will be, include the All My Ancestors genealogy, and this is one by Walter Goodman Davis, who's another name that you need to remember. He was the second guy into the uh, Genealogy Hall of Fame, <clears throat> and he wrote a series of 16 ancestral books to his 16 great-great-grandparents. And the All My Ancestors, as one would uh, expect, follows the surname line and publishes the line on just that particular surname. So while you may have a common ancestor back in these earlier uh, generations, the book may not follow your line uh, down. So the, the, there is a limit to whether that will be useful to you. Next, there is the what they call agnate, or the male descendant genealogy. And um, the, here we have Donald Lyons Cobus, Peter, Bu Peter Buckley, Reverend Peter Buckley genealogy. And in the area of scope, uh, we look at the 
title page that says that this is a genealogy of his descendants through the seventh American generation. So if you're approaching this book as having bulkly descendants that come right down to your parents, you are going to be disappointed because it never had that intent in the first place. The next one are books that follow both the male and female descendants. And the Mayflower family silver books uh, is the best example of that. But again, you need to look at the title page and you see that this is Mayflower families through five generations, although it actually has the birth of the sixth generation in it. So again, if you expect the book to have your grandfather in it, it's not going to. So understand the scope and the intent of the genealogy you're using. Next are those that uh, uh, do groups of individuals, like the Great Migration begins. But again here, pay attention to what the scope of the book is. Uh, this covers immigrants to New England from 1620 through 1633. Uh, if you have someone who came in 1634, he's not going to be in this book. And then the next section, uh, oh yeah, the next section is no format at all. This is my uh, least favorite genealogy, the Delano genealogy from 1899. It has no index, it has no numbering system, it has no formatting, and it's extremely congested, as you can see, and, and confusing. What looks like a numbering system here, uh, looks like this is John Delano Jr.'s number eight, it merely is a description of the following paragraph is of the eight children of John Delano Jr., which is followed by the six children of John Delano Sr., so it doesn't make a lot of sense either. So you are going to find in the older uh, genealogies some of these no-format uh, uh, books. And so my initials that I want to remind you of is RTP, read the preface. And not every book has a preface, and not every book has a useful preface. But here is the preface for the Great Migration Immigrants to New England, 1634 to 1635, which is the second uh, series in that series. And Bob Anderson actually has a chapter, a part of his introduction on scope, and he outlines the criteria for inclusion in the Great Migration. And so understanding the criteria of what he's publishing increases your ability to understand how it's going to be useful to you. Now back to the Sherman descendants, we find that, sh that Mary Holman did her uh, book in register style and she's numbered, the, the register style of course is the style developed for the New England Historical and Genealogical Society register and she's um, numbered uh, the individuals by birth order and then she's numbered them by continuous numbers. But here we see that she's numbering both the girls and the boys. So she's at least for uh, several generations, she's tracing all descendants, male and female, although later in the book she uh, leaves off tracing the females. But here for at least uh, two or three generations, you will get uh, detailed information about the girls and their families. Uh, she And then to... Uh, uh, expand on the scope. Even, she does not have a preface in her book, so she can't. She doesn't tell us what her scope is, but uh, we can tell by looking at the book that she's tracing gene uh, descendants through the tenth generation. So again, here, if you think your parents may be in this book, you may be correct because she's bringing it right up to people who, who were born in the 1930s or so. All right, restraint is a an obvious thing, or one, one would think it's obvious. And what you want to look out for is books that make grandiose claims about royal or noble ancestry. <clears throat> and if you, uh, if you want to know if your uh, immigrant ancestor has royal ancestry, look at Gary Boyd Roberts, uh, newest edition of the Royal Descents of Immigrants to the American Colonies. There's 900 of them now. And if, there, if your ancestor's not in that book, then you're pretty much out of luck. There's no proved royal ancestry if they, if they haven't made it into Gary's book. Also, you want to be skeptical at lines that take you back to Adam and Eve 
and lines that take you to Vikings and Norsemen and, and other really ancient peoples. Also look out for hyperbole, uh, especially in the uh, Victorian era. There was a lot of exaltation and romanticism of an ancestor's character and his deeds. Almost every ancestor was uh, called a very good person because they belonged to the church. Well, in those days, everybody had to belong to the church. There wasn't any choice about the matter. So it's not a necessarily an indication that he was a, of good character for belonging to the church. Next. Uh, okay, yeah, now really. Uh, this one is fun. This is 1,000 years of, the, of Hubbard history from 866 to 1895, tracing the family from Hubba the Norse Sea King to the enlightened present. Well, the, enlight the present wasn't very enlightened for him to have published uh, a whole bunch of malarkey like this. There are times and places where genealogies can be traced back into um, early history, usually for royal lines uh, mostly, but um, you're getting a little ahead of, ahead of reality when you start going back to Hubba the Norse Sea King. All right, citations and sources. You're, all, you're taught as you learn your genealogy that the books that have citations and sources are better than the ones that don't have them. Now, it doesn't matter whether the citations are in footnotes or endnotes or embedded notes. The, the, what matters what's in the citation. Does it have a clear description of the source that aids the reader in finding the original source to check it if he wants to? Is it uh, only giving you secondary sources only, which is a red flag you are you can't rely on even good secondary sources you can't rely entirely on does it give you an analysis of the sources reliability uh, is does the author think that this is a good source or a bad source and does it reference more sources for further information in your research um, next now and then a good thing is to read the footnotes or read the sources, which will have additional information. And in this case, this uh, reference uh, this references a book by a gentleman named Tingley, uh, which is a notoriously un uh, it's uh, under it's under my thing here. <laughs> um, oops, nope. Okay, it's notoriously not reliable. And in, as example, he claimed Thomas Harris was born on 2 October 1605, which was calculated from a completely spurious argument in the first, uh, spurious age at death in the first place. And then he invented three additional children for Thomas too. So uh, these are the kinds of things that you want to keep your eyes out for. Have all the logical sources been thoroughly gleaned, as the the uh, GPS uh, asks you to do? Have they gone? Have they just done births, marriages, and deaths? Have they gone beyond that to wills and deeds and church records and court records, etc.? Uh, always allowing for the access to these records, which is different in different time periods. Do they use primary records in their sources? Are they citing secondary sources that cite primary records? In which case, although you would still want to go back to find those primary records, at least they are the secondary sources that they are citing have some primary records. Or are they just citing secondary sources with no citations and and really not giving you any help at all. Next, all right, back to the Sherman genealogy. She used embedded short citations uh, for her probate and her deed abstracts. She was ahead of her, her time. The, the praise that Donaldine Jacobus gave her was because she abstracted deeds and probates um, copiously, which was a new idea in those days. But she has no references to vital records. She has no bibliography of these short forms. And the idea is that she was writing this book for those people who were knowledgeable enough to know where the Plymouth County deeds were. 
or to know where the Plymouth Colony records were. She was not writing it for someone who would have to find them. So in this case, she's behind the curve that we use today. All right, fourth, methodology and analysis. Um, the Okay, genealogical methodology has changed extensively over time, and we cannot expect our modern standards to have been used by authors in the past. So it is our responsibility to apply modern standards in our appraisal of any book and to use those standards when and if we use that work as a source or we post a, a, a tree to the internet or we do anything about spreading uh, it any further. As an example of analysis, uh, this is from the Great Migration Project. It, it, and again, I'll assign you reading. Uh, go through the Great Migration books and read the comments that Bob Anderson has given about uh, problems in uh, solving uh, the uh, the problems of these early um, immigrants. And in this case, it's Edward Garfield, and he mentions that Bond, and he's talking about Henry Bond, who wrote that big fat book on Watertown genealogies, uh, created much confusion in the accounts of this family by splitting the immigrant into two men and then doing the same thing with his eldest son. And then he goes on in the next page to mention that Savage, and he's talking about James Savage, who wrote the Genealogical Dictionary of, of New England, was unable to untangle Bo uh, Bond's presentation, so he went along with it, although with some obvious reservations, and stating that it seems to me that Dr. Bond has confused the father and son, uh, making them each die on the same day, and therefore having the age of the elder, making him unlikely to be the father of the grandchildren, of the children of the younger. And Bob then mentions that Savage had, in fact, put his finger accurately on the problem. This is to tell you and, and make it clear that things are not simple, that even though things have been published in earlier books and even though people swear by what's published in earlier books, untangling the knots is not simple. All right, next, oh yes, and then this is at the end of Bob's uh, comments here. He was talking about this Abigail Garfield who was supposed to have married John Parkhurst. And uh, the reference to uh, Sarah Parkhurst in a will does not provide support for this marriage, nor has any independent evidence been found for this event. But this marriage has been retained in this account as a probability although careful study of the Parkhurst family should be undertaken both for this problem and the one discussed above. So cautionary statements mean take caution. Next, all right, for Mary and her Sherman genealogy, we've determined that uh, she uh, used the leading methodology of its time of 1936. She used the Jacobus system of scientific and organized presentation, and she didn't get uh, in, into any undocumented claims of English ancestry or, or any uh, blown up uh, descriptions. But she does not have a lot of visible analysis or discussion in her book. We know that she would have gone through analysis uh, in solving different problems, but she does not put it in the book other than she does caution uh, the, regarding the early New England records. Uh, she also has limited citation and sources. She uses has strong use of deeds and probate records, and the um, but the uh, she does not cite vital records. She does not give the full uh, bibliographic sources, and so in that condition, she is uh, not up to the modern standards. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the information is wrong. It just means you're going to have to go and check the cit citations yourself. Uh, OK, access is the last one. 
And access it today is through mostly through digital books. Of course, all these books are in the library at the New England Historic Genealogical Society and other libraries with genealogical collections. But today, m most of you are going to access them through one of these uh, websites. There's Hattai Trust. Dot org and the Sherman genealogy is available on that website. Uh, it is available for a limited uh, uh, printout. You can print out a, a limited number of pages at a time. You can't uh, download the entire book unless you're a member of the trust. There's archive.org, uh, which allows you to download uh, PDF files or other versions of files of the books that it has, but in this case it does not have the Sherman genealogy, uh, but it uh, it leads you to the openlibrary.org where they do have the Sherman genealogy, but it's a borrow-only situation. You can borrow the book for two weeks and you cannot print out of it, but you can at least read the genealogy. Then there's additional lists, uh, additional digital books available through Ancestry, through Family Search, through Google Search and Google Books. Okay, review. All right, know what you are copying. Do not copy blindly. Do not pay it forward irresponsibly. That's how somebody probably already got you into trouble with a bad information. Know the author's goals and the limitations of what they're trying to do, and know their reputation and the book's reputation if you can find information on that. Always search for updates and corrections. In the 200 years since the book was published, uh, it is an undoubtedly uh, corrections and additions have been published in the periodical literature. And then finally, you need to learn to analyze for yourself. You can't just uh, call in and ask someone at the switchboard whether a, a book is good or bad. You have to learn how to do the analysis yourself. All right, thank you. All right, well, thank you, Alicia, for your presentation. Now let's tackle your questions. If you have anything that you'd like to ask, go ahead and type it into the questions panel, and we'll try to answer as many as we can in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so David is asking about British genealogies, and can the same criteria be applied to Brit British genealogies? He's asking specifically about, you know, things like Burke's peerage and Burke's landed gentry, you know, well-known sources like that. Um, but would you, cons a lot of the examples that we used were kind of American genealogies, and we talked more about the history of American genealogy, but would you say that the criteria could be used for um, English genealogies as well? <laughs> yes, the criteria can be used, although English uh, genealogies are different. There is not so much uh, the individual publication of family genealogies in England. Now, Burke's Peerage and the other uh, standards for uh, lineages are uh, uh, standard works, and you just need to understand that they are compiled from records that are filed with uh, the register of arms and, and coats of arms and et cetera, and that the uh, information is is compiled at second hand or second uh, uh, level so that it may or may not have some errors in it and it is not 100 uh, percent traceable. What has happened often with American genealogists is they have looked at Burke and again found someone with the same name and then copied the uh, coat of arms out of the book thinking that it's the same family. So avoid that. All right, thank you. Um, now, would you say that the same um, criteria or maybe some of the same considerations could be applied to other published references? Um, you know, Philip is asking, or sorry, Andrew is asking about uh, published, you know, New England town histories, um, things like mug books or local histories. Could you apply some of the same criteria that we've gone over today to publications like that? 
Yes, indeed, you can. Definitely to mug books because those are compiled from information that's supplied by a family without any review. Town histories are, are usually written by someone in the town, the minister or someone who is has access to original records. But again, just like everything else, it doesn't necessarily mean that the writer knew everything or was uh, a, 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 an educated historian. So yes, it, it, this kind of analysis can be applied to anything that you uh, need that you need to assess in doing your genealogy. Great. And uh, Philip asks, so is there a good place or places to find updates and corrections to older published genealogies? You know, we we talked about a few journals. Um, can you maybe run through uh, some of those four key or some of those key journals to look for corrections and additions? Might there be other places to find that kind of information? Right, yeah, there is no specific list where you can find all the updates and corrections. But the best thing to do is to go on to AmericanAncestors.org and go into the database and search under the category of journals and periodicals. Search for the family name that you're looking for or search for the author's name that you are looking for. And it will cover all of, well, all of, almost all but the most current issues of the register, of TAG, of the Mayflower descendant of the New York G and B of um, the, and there's a, there's a whole bunch more so that's a one shop stop in which you can cover all of the major genealogical periodicals at once great and uh, Elisa asks what is the best way to discover an article on an ancestor or a, say a person that you're researching is there one stop, uh, is there a kind of a one stop shop for that um, or are there several? Yeah, well, the, again, the, the best one stop shop is the Ancestry.org database search. Uh, there is no other comparable uh, search engine that will cover as many different articles as that one does. But always keep your eyes out as you are going through and using records, uh, if you, even if you're on Ancestry.com or, or whatever site that you're on, keep an eye out for any kinds of uh, guides or helpful information that might lead you to the genealogies on your particular family. And right, and just to reiterate, the website, the URL is AmericanAncestors.org, um, not Ancestry.org, AmericanAncestors.org. And uh, as Alicia mentioned, we have a number of scholarly journals that have been indexed and made available um, digitally, electronically for your use. So I would definitely um, check out our site. Um, now, kind of uh, thinking about as you're actually doing research and you're you're pulling books from the shelves and you're looking through these genealogies, how do you suggest, I mean, do you suggest taking notes in either a research log or, you know, a software program that, uh, that takes into account the reliability of the source? So I, I guess I'm wondering, um, kind of application or practical use, how are you recording this information um, for, for later use in your own family history, either writing it up or uh, sharing it with your family? Yes, indeed. You should be keeping a log of, of things that you are researching, whether it's original records or books. And note, you know, it doesn't have to be extensive notation, but note whether or not you found a problem in a book or note whether you found a review that suggested a problem in the book. Keep those notes in whatever um, condition works best for you, whether on the computer or in little note cards. Uh, and use them to review uh, the work that you've done. So if you've forgotten what you did with a particular book by the time you get to write your genealogy, you can go back and pull out the card and remember, oh yeah, this is the one that had the such and such. And Elizabeth asks another great question. So what's the best way to correct information in say a recently published genealogy? 
unfortunately, <laughs> there's not really a way of doing it other than writing your own version of the genealogy. This is a kind. This is part of the big catch 22. A book is written and it's distributed and it's put on the library shelves and people use it. Uh, there's no, no clearing house where you can send in corrections to it. Now on the internet there may well be eventually a clearing house where corrections can be sent in and actually some of the wiki sites um, are beginning to try to do that. But once again, you have to have the people who are writing genealogists read those uh, warnings on these sites uh, in order to try to stop it from being uh, passed on. And of course, the online, online websites and the online family trees are notorious. There's no getting rid of them at all, even as hard as one might try. So the only... Um, a solution to that is to publish your own version of a correct family tree or indeed to publish your own publish perhaps an article in one of the periodicals that updates the uh, book that you want to correct and uh, Tom asks so if you know that there is an error in a published genealogy what criteria would you use to judge the rest of the information in that book so as we've discussed you know today that no one book is wholly perfect, uh, that there is good and bad. So um, if you see, you know, a glaring error, error should you, um, how can you kind of uh, check to see if other information is correct or uh, you, should you just move on to another genealogy? How do you suggest uh, approaching that? Well, if it's a glaring error, then it's something, it, it's telling you to be cautious with the rest of the genealogy. But uh, don't forsake it, don't toss it out until you have examined the whole book and or certainly examined the whole book in relation to the family line that you're tracing. And it's a matter of experience, a matter of seeing good genealogies or better genealogies and worse genealogies to be able to make a judgment yourself about how much of that book is bad. If something is bad in it, is it, is it an entirely rotten apple or does it just have a, a rotten spot on one side? And another uh, great question from Eileen who asks, should you refer to the incorrect information that is available in published books? So again, as you're kind of researching, should you take note of what has been said, even if you know that it's wrong, um, especially again, if you are planning on writing or publishing an article or a book, um, should you take note of that to then bring up in a future publication possibly? Yes, indeed. Uh, first of all, it's to remind you it, when you go back and uh, assemble your genealogy that this was bad information so that you don't put it right back into the genealogy after having taken it out. But it's also uh, going to be something you'll put into footnotes. All, all of the genealogical articles in the periodicals in, have copious footnotes that include uh, not only comments on the uh, sources that they use, uh, but comments on the uh, corrections and updates to those sources. So yes, you, you want to alert your readers to the fact that this other genealogy exists and has wrong information in it, but you have determined that it's wrong, so don't repeat it. All right, before we wrap up, I just want to um, also encourage, you know, the question kind of came up, where do you find these sources, these published genealogies? And of course, uh, Alicia mentioned a number of online resources like archive.org and openlibrary.org, uh, ancestry.com, familysearch.org, um, and other sites like Google Books. But uh, Again, not everything has been digitized and is available online. So um, also looking at library catalogs, uh, you can go to library.nehgs.org and search our library catalog uh, that is separate from doing a database search. So a lot of these, um, a lot of these uh, genealogy sites, you know, the Family History Library included and other sites, you might have to search a different catalog to find the published volume. 
volumes. Also, uh, I also want to just mention WorldCat, um, which is, I think it's worldcat.org. That is another great source. So if you find something maybe in our library catalog, um, but you can't make it here to Boston to use our resources, you can type in uh, the title into WorldCat and then put in your zip code and see where perhaps the closest uh, copy of that volume is. So those are just some tips on actually locating the the published genealogies. But if you need more one-on-one -on -one help with your research, you may consider scheduling a consultation with one of our experts or hiring our research services team. You can learn more about those two services by contacting the emails uh, that appear on your screen. And I just want to thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center, AmericanAncestors.org slash education. I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.